you. Good evening. Welcome to the Queen Anne's County Board of Education work session, Wednesday, November 18th, 2020. Can we please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We please stand for a moment of silence for all those uh, people affected by COVID-19. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. I have a second. Second. Questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote on the motion to approve the agenda. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Approval of minutes opened and closed for November, November 11th, 2020. Do I have a motion? So moved. A second? Second. Thank you. No questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote on the motion to approve the minutes open and closed for November 11th, 2020. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. We're at presentations this evening. Um, we have been informed that Dr. Kane will be out um, at least past December 1st, 2020. We are grateful that Acting Superintendent Ms. Pauls is still with us. Good evening and thank you all for being here with us. At the presentations, we have independent audit report, Mr. Chris Hall from the TGM Group. And, Jane Towers. and Ms. Jane Towers, our new CFO. Thank you very much. President Harper. I'd like to introduce Chris Hall's stand-in. This is um, Daniel Enzel. He worked on the site audit for us, and he's going to do the presentation. He did bring hard copies for everyone. If you like hard copies, if not, it is posted online too as well. I would love a hard copy. That's great. And I know Mr. Smith will too. Ms. Morissette. And uh, Mr. Daniel, I didn't get your last name. E-N-F-O-R. Thank you, sir. Thank you for being here. Or as one of our locals, former students. Are you related to anyone who works here? Yes. Oh. My brother and sister in law are employees. Thank you so much. passed out. Um, as we said, my name is Daniel Enzer. I'm a CPA with TGM Group, a public accounting firm in Salisbury, Maryland. We performed the annual audit of the board's financial statements fiscal year 2020. Uh, this is a second year of a five-year contract. And dive right in. Prepared this PowerPoint just to summarize we're going to be discussing tonight. We're going to be reviewing your 2020 financial statements. And this is the organization of the financial statements. In the beginning section is management's discussion and analysis. So it's about eight pages that gives an overview of the financial statements. A summarized um, version, if you will, for someone who doesn't know anything about the operations of the board. Uh, they could pick up management's discussion and analysis and have a, a summary and have a pretty good understanding of, of the year. Um, after management's discussion and analysis, we get into the basic financial statements and they're separated. You have district-wide financial statements that include long-term assets and long-term liabilities. You also have fund financial statements, which is more of what you're accustomed to seeing on a month-to-month -month basis, and that uh, focuses on current assets and current liabilities, and then the notes to the financial statements. So those three sections combined are the basic financial statements, which is what we give our audit opinion on. Additionally, you have required supplementary information, uh, which helps the user. It places the information in a, a operational, economic, and historical context. And then also additional supplementary information that is presented 
um, and you move from more summarized version, summarized information at the beginning of the report to more detailed information. Uh, on page three of the financial statements, you will find our independent auditor's report. We expressed an unmodified opinion. That's the highest opinion that the CPA can give. Uh, there are no qualifications. Your financial statements are presented fairly in all material, in all material respects. Following the independent auditor's report is a, it's a report on internal control over financial reporting. Uh, it defines what a deficiency in internal control is, um, but the long and short of it is we did not identify any material weaknesses that needed to be communicated. Which is just defined as? Material weakness is a deficiency or a combination of deficiencies that there is a reasonable possibility that a material misstatement will exist. Defalcation. It's significant worst. enough, yes. As I briefly mentioned, management's discussion and analysis is on pages 8 through 16 of the financial report. There are a few uh, financial highlights. Now, this is prepared by management, so uh, the former CFO, John Fister, prepared this. Um, a few financial highlights. Obviously, the end of fiscal year 2020 was greatly impacted by COVID-19. A small silver lining in that is that the board experienced some savings. Your expenditures were below budget for fiscal year 2020. On the other side of the ledger, on a district-wide perspective, in the district-wide financial statements, your uh, net position decreased 16.5 million. What, say that? It decreased 16.5 million, and we'll take a look. Um, but that is mainly attributed to other post-employment benefits, health care for retirees. You have to, um, several years ago, Government accounting standards wanted governments to put that liability on the books for the future OPEN. future health care. Okay. The open. Okay. Um, so it increased a lot in fiscal year 2020, and it caused your net position to decrease. Do other public entities uh, try to put a fiduciary funding in order to? try to deal with that it's never going to go down because people are living longer so yeah you find that yeah you um, set up a trust fund and the board has a trust fund um, and you contribute as you can um, right now Queen Anne's County Board of Education is a pay-as-you-go so once you receive so the we invoice, have no balance pay uh, to pay for surprises about 500,000 set aside, but set aside. <coughs> on a year to year, it, you're paying as you go. Um, so as costs increase, as interest That hasn't accrues, been used? Uh, no, it's reserved. Uh, How is that expressed in the budget? Is it a fiduciary account that can only be used for that purpose? Okay. No evidence of borrowing or any of that business? No borrowing. Okay. On page 18 is your statement of net position. Yes. I have a question on that same thing. When did we lock, I don't remember, when did we lock the 500000 into that or does... Our choice or it's know. been set aside for a number of years um, it was just transferred to formal trust um, at the end of the year we did that for, only for our system or is that through may not through MABE, it's okay. uh, different. I'll have to look it up and I can get back to you. I think it's uh, through a different ac account now. They switched it over. I think it's Wilmington Trust or something, but I'll, I'll look. Okay. We discussed that last we December. We did. I was trying to, I'm trying to remember though. We, ma we, mo we made the motion on that last December oh. to, to go into that <coughs> trust. We, we went into the trust, but I didn't know we had pulled away $500,000. There was a large reserve. It was 
was already there. Yes. We didn't start a new one. Didn't start a new one. Okay. It was already there. Okay. All right. Thank you. To my recollection, we can, Ms. Towers can look that up. Thank you. Of course. So page 18 and page 19, these are referred to as your district-wide financial statements. And like I said, it includes long-term assets and long-term liabilities. You had about $15 million in cash and cash equivalents as of June 30. You had $157 million in, in land and capital assets, buildings, and such for total assets of approximately $175 million. Your liabilities are about 245 million and 225 of that relates to your OPEB liability. And which is under uh, oh, okay, I see on it. page Thank 18 yeah, it's I see grouped it. yeah, I see with it. Thank you. some other things. And then your net position is a deficit. It's 63 million deficit net position. It doesn't sound great, but you're not alone. A lot of boards of education are in the same position where the liability exceeds your assets. And so your net position is in a How deficit. much of that is, is the OPEB then? It's right there. 220. The total liability, yes. So you see where liabilities is? Yes. Okay, and then you go down to total liabilities? And then just below that is pensions and then OPEB. What would be an example of a fixed charge? Health care. Pardon me? Health care. Oh, that's where that is. Retirement? Yes. And that's because of gas charges. requires you to show on your books an accruing liability. Okay. What is an example of an unrestricted deficit? That's uh, basically what's left over, the unrestricted deficit. Um, so your net position, again, deficit of 63 million. Uh, I'm just looking at the very bottom under net position. Right. It's not a, a specific thing per se, it's okay. just the remainder okay. at the end of the day. That's not like fund balance. It is like fund balance. Okay. That, that 35 million would also include uh, pension, would it not? Or is that strictly on the, the state's books? What are you looking that, at? Sir? You have a pension plan, uh, which has a, a calculation on future, actually it's pretty simple. It's uh, income earned minus pensions paid, but people live longer, pe more pension money goes out. Is that included in you have a pension $35 million? Um, You have a pension liability. It's not nearly as large as the OPEB. So it's about $5 million is your pension liability. That's because the state picks up a large part for teachers. I'll skip ahead to the fund financial statements, and that begins on page 20. This is probably more of what you're accustomed to seeing. The governmental funds, it excludes those long-term assets and long-term liabilities um, and focuses on kind of a year operation. So you had 17.8 million in total assets. 4 million of total liabilities and your fund balance was 5.4 million and that includes the general fund uh, school construction fund and food services that is a it was a 1.7 million increase from the previous year so your fund balance increased by a little less than 50 percent it's good news Of that, some is assigned, though, too, correct? That's what I was going to ask. How much of that was already assigned? Uh, well, you have... We find that on here? Because I, I don't see it. I don't have prior year information to Oh, no, it is right it here. Under fund balances, because okay. committed and unassigned. Correct. So, yeah. And restricted. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. What is it? What is a, a an example of a non-spendable fund balance? Something in the trust in okay. your fund seven. Okay. 
Thank you. So a sign would be purchase order. So as of that 5.4, only 2.3 is unassigned or obligated. 2.3. Correct. The, uh, encumbered is the word we, we were. And the encumbered would be the assigned, some of the assigned 2.3 million. Okay. Correct. The health care contribution uh, to this fixed charge, uh, where does the employee contribution fit into this? Is, is this net of estimated employee contribution? That would be under health care oh, reserves, so isn't it? it's worse than I thought. Or is this typical for education systems? It is. Um, all the school systems that I know do the pay-go, pay-as-you-go type model. Page 22 is the statement of revenues and expenditures and changes of fund balance for the governmental funds. This is revenues and expenditures. The total revenues, 117.6 million. Total expenditures, 115.9. And as I stated, the net change in fund balance of 1.7. Low context in 2019, the change in fund balance was a negative 52,000. You get through the governmental funds on page 24 are the fiduciary funds, the retiree health plan trust fund. Uh, you also have regional education funds and school activity funds are included on in the fiduciary funds. But these are both fiduciary funds. They can't be used for anything except what they're designated to be used for. Correct. So. This money really isn't something that can be used mm -hmm. and shouldn't be used to offset anything other than... Correct, not for the general the, operation. The net worth of the system. If so, such a thing could ever be used to a government entity. Mr. Mark, the school activities funds of the 14 schools, they all have activity funds. So like the band, right. boost, any kind of boosters. So that's not a whole lot of money considering it's go across 14 schools and knowing how much sports costs and, and how much the boosters raise. So yeah, that needs to be allocated. I mean, not taught, again, on a fiduciary funds, can't be used for anything else. But my question is why can't we have used, we tap into that money when we need to, but. It, it's set aside, it's at the school um, level. So on page 62, we'll detail out, um, as Daniel was saying, that 797,000, which schools it is comprised of. And those are kept at the school location. It's their separate checking account. It's their separate funds. Right, they're annual, just annual. It's re renewed each year. Um, it, it does roll over. Any unspent will roll over to the next year for them to have available, yes. Yeah, that's not that's not stuff that we have raised. That's what the schools have raised. Mm -hmm. Schools have raised. Oh, okay. schools. Yes. Yeah, that's not that's not from the operating budget. Those are total fund, like oh, the boosters, okay. right, the band right. boosters, the football boosters, the chess club. You know, drama. I'm thinking of something else that we go in and out of. That no. would be the operating budget that we provide to the schools. PTAs. Ooh. I mean, they exactly. Well, I understand that now. I just. We do tap into other funds in our, our operating budget if we need to, things that we provide to the schools, right? Those are listed somewhere else. Um, in addition to state and county funding, then you're thinking um, maybe facilities, a rental of facilities, if that's what you're thinking, um, just thinking of some things that could come up. The, co the coaches, the referees, athletic money we handle. We decide to cut back on those operating funds for the schools as well. Co co correct. Um, there are expenditures that are allocated on an annual basis that you've approved an annual budget, and then they can um, be adjusted accordingly each budget year. Okay. So the, these are the different kind. I see. I got it. Thank you. Where were the regional education funds? What are those? I've there are ESMEC funds. Um, Sorry? 
ESMEC. ESMEC, okay. Yes, there's an office the things in the finance are, wing. Right. Um, <laughs> okay. So the board belongs to those. Just kind yes. of processes okay. invoices, but not our money. Okay, got it. Uh, the notes to the financial statements are from pages 26 to 48. Um, you have a summary of your significant accounting policies on note two, and that runs for several pages. Um, your pension plan is on pages 34 through 40, and the uh, OPEB liability is 41 through 46. And, give you all the information that you need um, on those items. It's, this is just a description? Yes, it's uh, just further Actually explanation telling us, okay. to the reader. the notes to the financial statements. You have required supplementary information. One being the budget to actual comparison. That's on page 50. Uh, we present the original budget, the final budget, and then an actual column. Can I go to page 33 real quickly, please? Capital projects due to general fund, food services due to general fund. This is money that is still owed to us from the government? No, these are uh, just interfund balances. So you have the general fund, the capital projects fund, food services, and- Oh, I see it's a wash, I see it. Yeah. So these projections don't take into account pending legislation and its impact on costs. These are just what are existing uh, by the year, uh, fiscal year ending June 30th. In other words, the legislature has been talking about uh, a change in the starting salary over a, a period of time. If that were to occur over four years, there would be a substantial increase in the liability for pension. But this doesn't take into account that because it hasn't happened yet. It, uh, the actuarial does the um, OPEB calculation. How could, they, how could they do a calculation on something that hasn't occurred? Right, so um, they'll probably adjust it each year as it occurs because um, it, it stair steps up to that 60,000. So, um, You'll see it over the next couple of years, and you'll definitely probably it's see that increase. It's more than 60000 per person because as the bottom increases, it yes. causes a compression that mm -hmm. creates uh, a need for other adjustments. Correct. Across the sal these salary scales, so yes. It's going to be a very expensive roll-up. You're absolutely right. To which there has been no source of revenue yet to be identified. And you're talking in, in some terms that people in the public do not understand what you're talking about. You're talking about the teacher salaries, no, and the actuarials. That's been and in how the newspaper. Yeah. Well, some people don't understand what you're I, talking. Okay. But I just want to make sure that uh, none of this has been built in yet. Well, it can't, sir. This is has. But that's because I just said it hasn't really been formalized. So. Maybe not that piece. The actuarial um, calculation is based on assumptions, uh, salary increases being one of those assumptions, interest rates. Uh, the pension plans are easy to cost. They're very difficult to pay for. It's just you have to have enough money earning enough interest to pay for projected pensions, benefits minus interest earned. Page 39, you can see some of the assumptions that are included. So you had to do some assumptions? I did not know. This is done by actuary, and we okay. use their work. interesting the investment rate of return I'd like to have that now so. anyway okay I'm sorry about uh, Look, table, page 50 unrealistic. yeah is that where we're headed at page 50 
Yes. Um, okay. That is the budget to actual comparison. Kind of lays out um, the savings that we've talked about on the expense side. Um, revenues exceeded expenditures by 1.5 million. Also, the uh, required supplementary information includes some additional OPEB and pension schedules. That's on 51, yeah, 52, and 53, and 54. Generally speaking, for a county this size, these are not surprising numbers to you at all. And as a matter of fact, they might be better than other counties this size or maybe other counties that are larger. The, the, the percent and so forth. We're not out of whack. How's You're not that? out of whack. You're about the same. Uh, very few other uh, school systems are setting aside money for pension or, or OPEB. But we, as I recall, even the life insurance premiums went up. These are nasty surprises over which we have no control. We just get told this is what it is. Late in the game. Okay. I don't think it's late in the game, sir. I think everybody's aware of it. We just don't have a way to, sub to uh, fund it. This excess, where is that? Goes the fund balance, and it will be utilized in okay, future so we've periods. Got an extra one and it's one point five million fund balance right now. We have two point three unassigned. Right. Two point three and unassigned. Oh, oh yeah, unassigned. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. So it will go to balance future budgets. Mm -hmm. What people do not understand that propose these things is it isn't just the cost of entry salaries. There is a compression roll up. There's a benefit cost roll up. There is this, there is that, workman's comp, everything is rolled up. So the total cost is a big number. Yes, and actually required and by law to be funded, yeah. Um, so the capital project expenditures, Ms. Towers, this has already been done on page 60. Page 60. This is, we've already, yes, it's already been paid for and done. That was this year? Yes, those were FY20 expenditures. So um, after required supplementary information, you have additional supplementary information. Uh, those schedules, one being a combining uh, schedule for capital projects and food service. Your general fund is a major fund, so it is presented by itself on the earlier pages. Uh, school construction and food service are presented in combination previously, then in a, the additional supplementary information they're presented separately. So that's on page 58. Uh, you have a detail of the capital project expenditures on 59. I'm sorry, that's page 60. Service fund on 61 and the detail of the school activity funds on page 62. So that is a deficit and on page 61. Page 61. The food service fund. Food service fund. Food service for the year uh, had a loss of about $24,000. And that's in line with what we've seen in other uh, school boards. The general fund had some expense savings while food service had a loss for the year and you're providing meals to to the community. For COVID, yeah. yeah. Well, we didn't get some of the state. Reimbursed. Yeah, we weren't reimbursed. Yes, you're getting Correct. reimbursed. Uh, some of it we were, so, but this is what was left after all the re reimbursements. For the year, yeah, you had a loss. The negative, yes. Well, past this, we were still feeding, so. Yes. Whole summer, we were feeding. Yeah. 
request of financial statements. Um, you have one additional report in front of you, the audit communications. I should be brief with this. This is required communications with the board, uh, those charged with governance. Uh, as we stated, the significant accounting policies of the board are on note two of the financial statements. No new accounting policies were adopted during fiscal year 2020. Uh, if there were accounting standards that were going to be implemented in 2020, they got delayed one year because of COVID-19. Also, as we've discussed, financial statements include uh, significant estimates and inherent estimates, uh, one being depreciation on your capital assets. You buy the asset, you depreciate it over its estimated useful life, so it's an estimate. And also the pension liability and the OPEB liability are based on estimates. It's actuarial uh, valuation. We set up a, dis a depreciation schedule. We don't depreciate to zero. We depreciate to a certain point. Of useful life? No, it's just appreciated to zero. Yes. So a school building has uh, so many years of useful life, and so the schedule depreciates its value to it, the end of its useful life. Significant renovations would be remembering things capitalized. from a distant past. Yeah. <laughs> um, Putting on your uh, county commissioner hat. <laughs> no, founding a business. Oh. So just a few other things. We didn't uh, encounter any difficulties dealing with management during our audit. Uh, any recommendations or adjustments that we recommended, they were made. Um, I see one that is useful under current your comments. We have one that, um, as we continue to flip through here, on page eight of the audit communications, we talk about some recently issued GASB pronouncements, uh, one dealing with fiduciary activities, and that specifically deals with the school activities fund. Um, once this is adopted, next year, fiscal year 2021, the school activities fund will no longer be presented as a fiduciary fund. It will come under the governmental fund. Reason being, the board in a roundabout way can dictate how those monies are spent. So they can be kept at the school level, but they're just gonna be shown on a different is that, page. Is that becoming law? Is that why? It's coming it's out a of new that. A requirement of gas. Yes. Yes. It, it allows flexibility to do that. It doesn't mean it has to be done that way. It's more of a presentation issue. Are, are, we, are we still mess? Are we still? We had a lot of problems with this school fund um, last year, year before, and we were trying to fix them. They were in an audit, and because there wasn't a lot of accountability at the school level. Um, the way it was collected, the way it was spent. There's a lot of opportunity for and that, get, that gets into our comment. Um, we didn't identify any material weaknesses. Uh, we had one audit comment, and it's really, it's um, to keep it in front of you, to make sure everyone's aware. And it's a little bit of a mute point in a virtual learning environment. Mm -hmm. um, right. But the schools are decentralized. They have their own bank accounts. And I, I think people underestimate how much money flows through those accounts. Over a million dollars in FY20. It was over 1.5 million in fiscal year 2019. Um, and so just need everyone to be aware that the cash handling at the school level is a risk. Um, and we want to get that money to the bank as soon as possible. I think we were putting, we, we were, uh, my, my brain's not working right, but we were talking about putting in some, some checks and balances. We didn't have any of that. And I don't know if we ever got there or we were on a step toward it or something. Yes, there was improvement. I'll continue to stress, um, as your auditor, I'd like to see money go to the bank every day. 
uh, it may not be feasible for everyone, so at least once a week. But I'd rather see someone take $1,000 to the bank rather than hold that money and take $10,000 to the bank every two weeks or so. Are we talking about cash or are we talking about checks or are we talking about both? We're talking about both. This is at the school level and that's probably where most of the cash is. Uh, so staff and I met about this um, when I got the audit communication and we have some ideas as a group and we're going to present it to uh, Ms. Pauls and uh, Ms. Pauls in a couple weeks and um, present it maybe to ANS and get feedback and just strengthen. There's always room to strengthen um, what we're doing. So we're definitely looking into that. That's great. Glad to hear that. Definitely. Um, if, if I could take this moment to, to thank the finance staff, the, the very dedicated staff, to get an unqualified opinion, um, to have a, um, I just hats off to the hard work. It's just a lot of hard work that goes behind this, and I definitely want to um, acknowledge their work. Thank you. Now, we send this over to the county commissioners and to the state. It was submitted to uh, MSDE by September 30th is their deadline. So okay. it's been submitted. It's already been gone. Yes. Okay. And then do we have to present with, to the commissioners, I'm thinking, normally? Is that the or procedure? We, or we just send it over to <coughs> send it over. Just send it over to <coughs> Jonathan Siemens. That'd be great. Okay. Of and course. There's questions. Don't we have a committee that talks to their committee? Well, it would be it would be Ms. Towers would speak to Jonathan Siemens over there at the county. I'll reach out tomorrow then. You'll be talking to him. Yeah, and then answer any of his questions. Of course. And you're some, you there's one. some things coming they need to be aware of. Well, I, we have our meeting with them on December 1st or December 7th. I think that was canceled. So I know that uh, Ms. Pullen and I will be going over to talk a little bit about capital projects. Okay. We'll find out if, he, if Mr. Siemens wants to arrange a meeting. I mean, you guys can handle that. I also want to give commendations for Ms. Towers. She's only been here for a short period of time, but she really has um, done an amazing job with understanding our budget and, and sharing with me and keeping me updated about the funds. So kudos to Jane as well. Appreciate and it. And to the entire uh, team. They, they do a great job. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thanks for coming tonight. Absolutely. Happy thank you, holidays. Mr. Is Ms. Forbes out there or? Mr. Answer, how long have you been here doing this audit? How this is our second year. I mean, how long has it, worked, it taken to get this prepared? I was wondering. How long does it take? I mean, how long were you here to prepare this? You, um, like a, we're on site for several weeks uh, in August and then uh, spend the last couple weeks in September pulling it all together. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Happy holidays, sir. Thanks, Ms. Towers. Appreciate it. Ms. Forbes, TPE data. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, you can take it off if you like, because okay, it's hard to hear. Perfect, thank thanks, you. Yeah. And I'm alone, so. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so hi, uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Julie Forbes. I'm the Supervisor of Accountability, Assessment, and Data Management. And this evening, I'm gonna share some data from the teacher and principal evaluations from 2019, 2020. And this is data that we share on an annual basis. So tonight I'm just gonna do a brief overview of the components of the evaluation and also just an explanation of how it changed this year due to a waiver that was issued by the Maryland State Department of Education due to the COVID-19 school closures. And um, again, just review those evaluation ratings, look at how the two years differ, and then look at the data. 
So teachers and principals receive an annual comprehensive evaluation. Um, it, in a typical year, it is based uh, partially on professional practice and also on student growth. Due to the COVID-19 closure, a waiver was issued by the Maryland State Department of Education to waive the student growth component, uh, mainly because students were not in buildings to take the assessments that would then determine if they had made the progress um, and met the goals that were set. So due to that, the comprehensive evaluation score is based solely on that professional practice piece. And that waiver was issued um, in April of 2020. And based on the calculations, teachers and principals are identified as highly effective, effective, developing, or ineffective. <clears throat> and this just gives a little bit more detail about the different ratings. Um, and, and based on you know tenured versus non-tenured teachers, um, the rating of developing is used for non-tenured. Gives a little more detail. Um, the professional practice domains look at planning and preparation, instruction and assessment, classroom environment, and professional responsibilities. And then um, due to, again, the waiver, there's, we don't have that student growth component that we normally have. So they, that comprehensive evaluations were based solely on those, those domains. And similar for, uh, for principals, they receive that evaluation on an annual basis. The developing rating is used for newer, um, new principals. And there are 10 components um, that are looked at for principals, and they're all listed there. So this is a slide just as a reference. So this is the evaluation model for the current year because we do not have the waiver in place this year because the intent is that we'll be able to give those spring assessments. Um, so I share this for context and this is how evaluations were calculated for 2018-19. So when I shared data last year for the prior year, this was basically what we were looking at. Typically the teacher evaluation is 50% based on the student growth and 50% based on those professional practices. Is. And then you can kind of see the point breakdown. And then those two scores are combined for the comprehensive score. And the table on the bottom tells you how those different comprehensive scores are um, assigned based on the points. And it gives the range. Mm -hmm. What kind of discussion do you get from a person that's rated effective and scored 20 points? You know, those conversations happen at the school site, and I imagine the question might be asked, what do I need to do? You know, how can I improve to that highly effective that, that's status? That's difficult mm -hmm. with a numerical system. It is. And teachers have set goals, so a lot of the discussion will be based on the goals that they've set. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then due to the waiver, the teacher evaluation was modified based on the waiver and the student growth component was removed. And so those professional practices became 100% of the score. And the range for the different ratings is shown here. And that was um, the, the range that was set. So instead of 24 points, we're now talking about 12. <clears throat> And similarly, this slide captures the principal evaluation. So again, how principal evaluations will be um, tabulated this year. And they were previously for 2018-19. So again, 50% on the professional practices and 50% on the student growth component. And then that table on the bottom covers how they earn that comprehensive score as highly effective, effective developing, or ineffective. Again, the removal of the student growth component um, shows how that breakdown happened. So then it was just again out of 12 points, similar to the teachers. And so this captures the actual results of um, the comprehensive evaluations that were issued for 2019-20 for teachers. There were 542 evaluations that were completed. And um, <clears throat> of those, when you compare it to the prior year data, um, actually there was an increase in the highly effective and effective ratings. So we did see some teachers shift over, so. What is the incentive? for teachers to improve if they're already highly effective? 
a stay there as the, I guess? I would, I would think that's certainly a component and we have many fine, excellent educators who I think are always striving for that, that highest level. And dependent on their goals for the year because their goals change each year. So it could vary. Most principals would ask um, teachers to up the ante a little bit. <laughs> And then this captures the evaluation results for our principals. And again, everyone, all of our principals were effective and highly effective, very similar to the teachers. Um, the teachers, the teachers in the ineffective and developing category were less than 1%. And when you compared the principal data to the prior year, the um, category where you really saw some movement was in the highly effective category, more people moving into highly effective. Some of that was due to the, the ratings that come back from MSDE. We had several schools who made large increases with their, with their um, student data mm -hmm. from the year before. So we had, there what? School. we had five star schools. Oh, the stars. Right? <coughs> yep, we, okay. we had five, several, uh, I think three or four or five star schools. We had Blue Ribbon School, so. Oh, very exciting, that's what we like to see. And so, and of course we will continue and we're in the midst of the evaluation process this year with the more complicated uh, calculation because we do have the student growth component back in for this year, unless anything changes, but that's based on the current status. Still in for now. Yes, still, still for now, anything's possible. But right now, um, the student growth component is a piece of the evaluation. Are there any disagreements between the supervised and the supervisor and how, how is that, mitigated or smoothed over. I, I don't need to know names and places, but that's a very difficult conversation. So teachers write their SLO, their student learning outcomes, and they have measures that they follow to achieve those goals. So midpoint through the year, there's a conversations with principals and teachers to just kind of talk about progress or lack of progress. And teachers have the opportunity to make changes if they need to make changes at that particular point in time. If they see there's some type of extenuating circumstance where they cannot meet that goal, they're able to change those goals. So usually they're pretty much on track as to where they will, um, and it's all rubric based. So they pretty much have an idea of where they're probably gonna fall out towards the end of the year. So but I've not heard of any real strong disagreements, but that doesn't mean that they haven't happened. There's two ways to look at it. One, there's a lot of trust between the evalu evaluator and those being evaluated. The other, the other way of looking at it is the goals are too easy to attain. Well, they have to I be think approved. That's true. Yeah, they have to be approved by the principal. Yeah. And they have conversations when they set those goals and it's based on on data, you know, usually your your pre-assessment data and where do you think you will move your students and so many of them are pretty lofty and some of them are based on state assessments so they really don't have uh, you know too much of an opportunity to um, to argue it. I mean, they set, I think that, I feel like the teachers set really strong goals and work really hard to achieve them to make sure that every child is achieving. So. Well, I think it shows uh, in our student performance. Yes. Anybody else? I, I have one. And this is something that in the future and perhaps, it, you know, we get a new superintendent. We do not have a method and I don't know if other schools do, school systems do to evaluate um, uh, executive team. We we do a lot of evaluation of principals and you know administrators and the teachers, but we have no, as far as we know, there's no set way that the executive team is it, it is unless it's just a leadership thing where if you're a good leader, you tell them what do you expect at the beginning of the year and they have to meet that requirement. We have none of that as far as I know. Do other school systems have that? They do. They do have. Um, I know that Dr. Kane met with her leadership team and they kind of set goals and they had meetings um, throughout the year to talk about meeting those goals. So um, uh, Ms. Bass might be able to, to talk a little bit more about that since she's gone through it, but it's a similar process. They just don't, they're not always tied to student performance. Are they, do they have it written down where they get Should counseling, be. midway counseling and all that or? I just said the performance team um, 
Madam Superintendent certainly did have that um, done. It's done each year, it, and like uh, Superintendent Paul said, it's not tied to student learning objectives. It's more the district. It speaks to the mission that we're on. So we have it, and then we have a January meeting to make sure we are where we're supposed to be okay. based on the August conversation. Okay, I didn't know that. Thank you. That. Well, That's fine. That's enlightening. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions for Ms. Forbes? Thank you very much. Happy holidays. You okay. too. Well, Thank you. at least happy Thanksgiving. Yeah. I know I'll see you in December. Yes. <laughs> Ms. Forbes. <laughs> um, Mr. Combs, is he here? It's um, Ms. Passon is next. New Ms. Passon? New Come on down, Ms. <laughs> Passon. <laughs> Principal and Teacher Mentoring Program. Miss Bridget, no long time no see. <laughs> get some more of those brownies. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening, President Harper, members of the executive team, Miss Pauls and members. Um, no, Ms. Harper, members of the board, Ms. Pauls and members of the executive team. Um, for the record, my name is Bridget Passan. Um, I yeah, this please. Off since I'm by myself, if that's okay. Please. My primary role um, with the district is, uh, is as the ELA supervisor for intermediate through high school grades. Um, this year, I've gained an exciting new role um, that I'm embarking on as the mentor program coordinator. So uh, in, and I'll just set the context for how um, this was assigned to me. So in the late spring, early summer, um, the executive team decided to take uh, the mentor program in a different direction. Um, in prior years, we have had um, retire, rehires come back and support our new teachers. Um, and they decided to have uh, us pair new teachers with master teachers in their building. So this, uh, researching this and looking at how it was done in other places in the state and across the country was given to Tiger Team 6, um, which I happen to be a member of. So as with anything, it always helps when there's a central office liaison for our initiatives. Um, interestingly enough, this component of, of, of uh, new, the new teacher program falls under the big umbrella of professional learning at MSDE. Um, the grant that I manage, the Title IIA grant, falls under that professional learning at MSDE. So this was also kind of a natural fit because uh, the work and training I do to manage Title IIA, um, a subcomponent of that is the new teacher and the mentor program. So that's why you're seeing this, this new title, um, this new role under my name. Any questions about that or how that was decided? Okay. That Title II, I mean, that Title II money, though, is, it's got its own whole purpose, right? Yes, for profession, for the um, hiring, uh, developing, and retaining of teachers and principals. So another piece of mm -hmm. the, the main office at MSDE who controls Title II, they also oversee the induction program. Okay. So okay. these are people with whom I have relationships. There is money that we could certainly use for the hiring and training for new teachers. Um, we don't get a lot of money in Title IIA, you know, necessarily to do that. So that's why they kind of hold it. And I thought it was specific to a certain group or not. It's just strictly professional development, your Title II. Title II is, but it's lots of different things. Right. It has to do um, with anything uh, that will lead to training any kind of stakeholder in the school system. Oh, okay. All right, great. Okay, all right. So my purpose here today um, as well is to, oh, I'm sliding down, okay, uh, to provide you an update of what we did for New Teacher Orientation Week, um, which I also take the lead on, uh, and New Teacher Professional Learning Activities in compliance with COMAR. So what I show you here is all in compliance with, with the COMAR regulation. There's three things I'll talk about tonight. Um, I'll talk about what we do during New Teacher Orientation Week and how that looked this year due to COVID-19. Uh, uh, I'll talk briefly about the professional development models um, that our teacher specialists and academic deans use, and I'll share information about um, the current direction of the teacher mentor program. 
just uh, some data here for our certified hires by school year, and I kept uh, information from last year so you could kind of see the trends. Uh, as you see, definitely a dip in this past year of hiring. Um, we only had 29 new hires, uh, which is certainly a change from the years we are mostly closer to 40. Uh, and again, a lot less movement due to the pandemic. Nonetheless, we greeted those 29 new hires uh, in the week before um, we had all teachers come back. That was uh, August 17th to uh, August 21st. Um, and you can see there I had approximately 25 new hires. Uh, so I apologize for being four off in the chart above. Uh, this was all done virtually. Um, so our new hires had the choice to, um, we had them come into their schoolhouses the first day um, so they could see where they were going to teach so they could be in their classroom. And then we gave them a choice the remainder of the week uh, where they felt more comfortable. Uh, the majority of them did choose to go into their buildings. Um, they were welcomed by Dr. Kane and Mr. Paluski. Um, they got a wonderful message from Ms. Wright, our teacher of the year. And then we did all our sessions with them virtually. They met with Comtech, they met with um, their respective CNI supervisors, uh, the Office of Accountability uh, and Human Resources. They also had school-based sessions and the Education Association hosted two different virtual meetings. So lots of, um, lots of opportunities to greet them and welcome them and onboard them to, to Queen Anne's County Public Schools. Part of the professional development that these new teachers receive um, includes monthly support, monthly meetings with their uh, academic deans at the high schools or their teacher specialists. Uh, this year, which I'll talk more about later in the presentation, uh, they have a school-based mentor so uh, to support their planning, their management, uh, their instruction, and their professional responsibilities. Additionally, we have that two-credit um, course that they take during their second year of teaching. Okay, so everything I'm gonna show you, I also showed to the principals and I am conducting um, new mentor orientation and training tomorrow evening from 3.30 to 6.30. So they will also see this information. So this information comes directly out of what we submit to the state in our strategic plan to show them how we are adhering to COMAR. And there are four pieces uh, under this part of the plan uh, and that the new teacher induction program that they re require information on. So the description of the teacher induction, description of our mentors, the scope of the mentor program, and then the mentor program evaluation. So you can see a lot of those components have to do with the mentor program. Yes, sir. How do the new teachers get hooked up with a mentor? I'm going to tell you in a couple I more I figured slides. so. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so just a reminder that our new teacher inductions, they, our new teachers um, for the mentor program, uh, for the induction program, are brand new to the profession. They have never taught anywhere um, at any time, and they receive these services and this support until they're granted tenure. Um, veteran teachers who come to us from other states or other districts in Maryland participate in these activities at a minimum their first year, and then they can make a decision with their principal um, if they would like to continue with them or need to continue with them beyond their first year. So this year, um, of the 29 that we eventually hired, um, only six of them are brand new to the profession. Uh, so we were able to take these six, as well as teachers, uh, year two teachers. So those teachers in their second year of teaching, there are 10 of them. Um, and then we have one year three new teacher who was still getting the support of a mentor. So part of the work that Tiger Team 6 did to get ready for this new program is we created a job description of what a mentor would be expected to do, what a mentor who is also a full-time teacher would be expected to do. So principals were given this description um, and asked to pair their new hire with a master teacher in the building, preferably a master teacher who was also in the same content. Um, in many of these cases, that worked out. Of these 16, I would say that's the case in about 12 of them. In some cases, they didn't necessarily have that or they have a teacher whose leadership skills they're working to develop um, and who can do that in this mentoring, which involves coaching as well. Um, so they selected them for that reason. In two of these instances, the new teachers um, teach uh, special music. Now in our buildings, and 
our elementary and middle particular, there's only one, one teacher. So that can be difficult to pair them up with. Luckily, they have been paired because principals spoke to each other and decided um, they've been paired with a teacher who works in a school that is physically close to the school in which they teach. All of this will be happening virtually this year. Um, but the selection was purposely made with the principals informed of the expectations, reviewing their, their staff list, thinking about their faculty, and pairing them up accordingly. Did I, did I answer your question? Okay, good. That's what I was hoping to do with this slide. Okay. All right. So just to show you kind of how it all shakes out and so that you're seeing the exact same information that our principals and our mentors um, will see, um, this is a real partnership between the new teacher and the mentor. So. Um, the, the real hope is that they can spend two hours per week um, engaged in coaching and planning um, and an informal observation. Understandably enough, our principals had concerns about two hours under the current situation and with all that our teachers are doing this year um, to teach in, on a, in a distance platform. Um, it is a lot and essentially we're, you know, all of our teachers are new teachers this year. While good instruction in the classroom is good instruction uh, in distance learning, there are so many new resources that we have to get familiar with with learning. Um, and so they were concerned about that, so we compromised on a minimum of one at this current time. Um, and I did reach out to the state just to make sure you know that things were okay and the state is very supportive um, of that and very flexible um, with that because of COVID-19. Um, following all that work, um, the principal and I also share um, a partnership in monitoring that and making sure um, all the, the I's get dotted and the T's get crossed. So we have to watch for payroll. Um, there's a log that mentors have to fill out indicating the work that they did with their mentee during that hour or during both those hours. Uh, the mentor is uh, encouraged to reach out to the principal um, just to touch base, but also if there's any issues. And I'll do I'll touch base with the mentors um, on, on a monthly basis, virtual, uh, in a kind of an informal setting, and then bi-monthly in a formal meeting. We hope to get them in to observe other teachers, um, and I'll talk to the new mentors tomorrow night about this and how we're gonna work this out so they can see um, another teacher of their content um, who is really doing well, and all our teachers are doing well. I've been observing and talking to specialists, and there's so many good things happening, but so they can see another teacher um, of their content uh, teach, uh, and they can observe, and then they can have a, a reflection session with their mentor. There's responsibilities there that were explained in the strategic plan between the principal uh, and me, plan the same, watching payroll and making sure that the work gets done by reviewing those logs. The training for mentors, um, again, my fr this program got finally formalized and put together uh, late October, um, early early this month. So the first official training for them is a three hour training um, tomorrow evening. And then my hope is to meet with them um, bi-monthly, virtually as long as possible in January, March, and May. And it's my job to design that relevant, um, timely PD for them. As far as why the late start? The late start on the mentors. Why? Well, when we came back as Tiger Teams in September, everything was getting approved and finalized, and there were lots of there, there happened to be just a, you know, other priorities ahead of this from disseminating the information and gathering it. So it probably went out three weeks into September, uh, with all the principals had on their lists. I, I gave them till early mid-October to start giving me names. Um, I held some meetings because they had some additional questions and then it all it all got sealed. So our October. new our new teachers, how are they doing? So interestingly enough, they uh, several of our principals had already gone ahead and done this and we got the okay from payroll to back pay. Okay. Those people who were acting as mentors, um, they've been getting support from their chairs or their teacher specialists, reading specialist, math specialist in any event. Um, and they've also, uh, and again, in, in using my other, putting my other hat on and talking with my reading specialist today, teams um, have really rallied around each other. 
um, in supporting one another and around their new teachers. So they have not been out there flying on their own. Um, they have been supported, but we're going to make that this the support way more targeted um, and a pro, uh, and guided. Okay. Um, thank you. Yep. Great. No, great question. I should have addressed that. Thank you, Ms. Oh, well, I just happened to catch it, but yeah. thank you very yep. much. One thing that might uh, have been happening, I can't, I, they're probably young, right? And so they're probably very good at virtual learning. So there's probably some co-teaching going on back and forth. Yes, like it will be a real partnership this year. The, the techno technological savviness of, of our new hires, um, I've learned by watching them in presentations. So it's been, or in formal observations. Mm -hmm. So um, that is that is a really good point um, as well. So we supervise them together, again, with all those formal pieces of watching payroll, watching their logs, um, making sure we're reaching out to them to discuss um, all that's going well and maybe address any concerns that they might be having with their mentee. And then uh, it, we have to monitor the scope of it. Um, so there, this is where we bring HR into the fold, which I know Vanessa and her team always, you know, help out with getting me numbers and those numbers you saw earlier as soon as possible, and in reporting to the state. So they get us the new uh, higher data, including certification years teaching. So we're able to start there to figure out, okay, who, who is brand new to the profession and needs a mentor and for how many years. Um, we'll also survey the principal several times uh, regarding how it's going. Um, and getting the names of, of the master teachers with whom they're pairing the mentees up with. Um, and then I'm responsible for reporting out on all those numbers and the roles of the mentor. Excuse me. So in learning uh, more about this, we have always uh, surveyed uh, all stakeholders on the mentoring program and that will continue to happen. Um, I've been nudged to look at some uh, resources from West Ed, which has published many things on mentoring teachers. Um, so I'll look at that as well uh, to, uh, to, to adjust some of the surveys for this new direction of the program as to how our mentor program uh, went this year, uh, the stage that it's at, you know, and hopefully next year I can come back to you with, with some data, uh, with data to show you how this year, and especially in the circumstances, the mentor program and the new teacher induction program occurred. Any questions? Any questions for me? <clears throat> I think you might want to check with the state because we had to write a policy when we first um, instituted the um, the mentor program. Ms. Draper was responsible for that. So okay. somewhere up there in that file, there was a policy that had to be written. And then a copy of the new plan has to go to MSDE as well, too. Um, and I think it would be nice to speak for Ms. Bass that if the uh, mentors at least were acknowledged or got some type of thank you that for the service, because some of them had worked as mentors for over 10 years, and they never received any type of uh, letter or anything that there wouldn't be a mentor program this year. So many of them were calling me, asking me, and I was like, why? Well, you know, I don't know. So some of them realized it when their email was cut off. They said, we don't have email oh, anymore, goodness. what to do. So I think it would be nice to at least acknowledge some of them who have been around for years, I think. Uh, a lot of our retirees have come back and been mentors. Yep, over the years. Over so. the years, and we're grateful for them. We need to, we really do need to acknowledge them. Thank you, Ms. Pass. That's a great idea. Thanks, Thank Ms. you, Ms. Pass. And that's an excellent point because then if we have a database of who is experienced in mentoring, we can mentor the new mentors. Yeah, and a lot of them weren't coming back anyway just because of the whole COVID thing and, and you know, the age. But I might have a copy of that policy and all of that. Okay. I might have it somewhere okay. electronically. Right. I know it's in yep. the file cabinet, but I might have it electronically, so that will be... Oh, very helpful for you. Okay. Thank so, you, Ms. Pauls. Thank, thank you, you Ms. Passett. All right. Happy thank Thanksgiving. Happy Stay Thanksgiving. Safe. Thank you. You want to yell to Mr. Combs out there, Michelle? Oh. Thank you, Ms. Pullen. Mr. Josh? <coughs> Good evening. You can take it off, sir. It's fine. 
Good evening. Uh, for the record, my name is Josh Combs. I am the Technology System Supervisor here. Uh, tonight, I'm going to recap our five-year capital technology plan, our phase two. We are in year two already. Um, out of the five so far. Now the first year is an overview of what we requested versus our adjusted amount. So we requested 1.6, we got 1.2. And then I laid out at the bottom what we cut. So we cut out uh, infrastructure upgrades, um, school requests. Uh, instead of buying brand new laptops for the teachers and doing leasing, we had to buy off lease. Uh, laptops in order to make the numbers work. Um, this was the first year where we, or the second time that we were, did 9th or 12th high school student laptops. So that was our primary concern was getting the students their uh, laptops. And then paying the lease for the Dell Chromebooks from the year before. That would be the second year for 5th or 8th. That's what we did last year. This year, We originally asked for 1.9, county, county told us 1.4. That's what they budgeted for their plan, that's what they put in the books as of last year. Now they turned around and cut $200,000 this year out of it. So reality, we only got 1.2 for this year. So one of the things we did is, uh, I haven't done anything with power school yet. Um, we did replace the firewall, got a redundant firewall and a better firewall. Uh, we had to cut out school requests. We were able to, between the grants and the capital, we were able to do third and fourth grade Chromebooks. That's where that purchase came from. Uh, since we didn't have to, we didn't do leases for laptops from the previous year, that was normally was gonna be my plan, so we didn't have to worry about that. And then paying off the lease payments from the high school laptops and the middle school Chromebooks. And those are payments that you'll keep seeing repeating every single year until they're paid off. We do four-year leases for the schools. The next year. Josh, I have one question. No, go, go for it. It's like the second year we've taken out these school requests. So what is it there? That could be something like... Um, it could be projectors, it could be, it's, it's technology stuff that's usually over a thousand dollars that the schools request. Um, is it crash uh, carts? Carts could be, yes. Yeah, so I call it crash carts, but carts. <laughs> yes. <that> lap <laughs> Laptop carts. Laptop it's anything carts. that's outside this, the normal plan, but the schools still need it for technology. So most of the time it's, inter it could be interactive, flat panels, it could be projectors. It's kind of in that realm. More of um, a teacher's wish list. Basically, yes. I think it's interesting though that um, when we went to CES, they they had a smart board, and that made it easier for them to project while they're doing it online with the mm -hmm. students in class. So CES and that and was donated Centerville. by the PTAs. Yeah, so. CES and Churchill between Title One or PTA, they were able to purchase some of these interactive flat panels. I, I do like them. They're um, very similar to a projector, but it's just a TV and it's touch, connects to the laptop. It's basically the same thing, but... Sellersville um, has a lot of... Sellersville, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Those panels would be very beneficial for your special needs classrooms. Some of them did. They had smart tables. Michelle, that was I the couldn't original hear a word you said. Some of those... TV screens you're talking about would be very beneficial for special needs classrooms because you have students with low vision. The smart, Judy has, Judy has purchased some down in Sellersville. And they were originally the one that first came up with the idea that they had the smart tables. Mm -hmm. um, they're the first ones that kind of had it, and that kind of led to these TV design. The TV yeah. design. Uh, I've seen both, and the, the whiteboard's kind of cloudy looking, and these are sharp. So somebody are. with a low vision issue could see what's, what's it, being produced. The only difference with those is they cost a lot more money up front. Mm -hmm. you get, the return investment, you do get it, get it, but you got to pay more money up front in order to get one initially. It's cheaper, more expensive than a projector, but you get a return about five years. You get your return on your money because it'll last. 
refactorize these to the last 10 years, mm -hmm. so which is a lot longer than a uh, standard projector. Those kinds of things are, you know, if we've got CARES money left over, I mean, they fall right in with the idea of CARES, I would think, because we're all forced to do virtual. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a reflection of, in my mind, the... We need to get a gig first. Pardon? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And Ms. Towers has a handle on that money. She, actually, we met today, and she oh. kind of talked mm -hmm. about what's there. Some of the accounts have been spent out. Okay. But um, there's there's a little bit of money. But there are restrictions on what can be purchased as well, too, with some of it. So. Okay. Can we get an update on that at the December meeting? Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, next year, um, what we had on the plan was uh, replacement of our Queens County SAN, which is um, where all of our primary data center servers and all of our staff files and backups are stored. So this is a historic thing. You keep asking for close to two, and we're getting one, three? Yes. Yes. They pretty much, what they said, uh, they put in 1.4 for the next six years. That's what they said. And then, so I kind of knew I had adjusted back down to 1.4 from my request, and that's what you're seeing here. Now, sure. the past two years, I got, we got cut an additional 200 on top of that. So, Josh, so, you have on here laptops or teachers lease year three, so we didn't get them new We did not do a lease purchase because we just purchased them outright in year one. Year one, year one or year two. Okay. Yeah. So that would, that was, I'm just showing you that's what I cut. That's what it would have been part of my plan. Since we didn't have to do a lease, that line item is no longer needed. Therefore, you get that money back. Uh, next year's kind of primary focus for me was the high school and elementary lab desktop computers. Um, and then PLTW and CAD lab computers, basically the lab computers, all the lab computers. Where's the first and second grade computers? That was not, never part. Of, our plan wasn't part of okay. phase one. It was never part of phase two. So we how paid did that we purchase out. that? We purchased that through the state grant. Gotcha. Thank you. Thanks for reminding me. And then um, again. So your four is going to have to be readjusted to 1.4. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, you see the thread. You see the, I yeah, see you, it. You see the. Yes. Yeah, so. So the classroom desktops are going to have to go away. Uh, yeah, the, 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 the other yeah obviously we always focus on the student device first, okay. um, and, and then we have to back up from there. Sometimes I have to back up from infrastructure in order if we can meet the needs of the teachers as well. Um, so in and, and the fourth year, yeah, what I have is we originally have the plan. Again, it works if we get 1.4. If we're not, then we have to make adjustments, um, which was replacing the servers at the schools. We'll be hitting the five-year cycle for that. Classroom desktops, again, we're hitting the four or five year cycle for that. Same thing for SPED. Special education staff laptops are a one year difference between the classroom teacher desktops. They were bought a year before. So that's why it's, you see it's offset and when they get replaced versus when the teachers get, the classroom teachers get replaced. And then the f fifth year, we're basically starting Again, with the high school laptops, replacing the high school laptops. Um, oh, you know, another thing on year five, or year four, we'll be starting again, replacing the fifth and eighth grade student Chromebooks during how a new four year lease. How often do you have to replace switches? I mean, what, don't you have like some. Oh, uh, switches. Well, servers, we generally do a, a five-year warranty. I try to keep it running as long as I can until the warranty, I can no longer get a warranty. Once I don't get a warranty, then we're in a bad situation. So it's one of those things where if I have to cut it and I can, I can get a warranty instead of maybe hardware, then I'll go that route in order to save money for buying student equipment. Because that's a big important year because in year four, we're doing fifth or eighth again. For, so that's obviously going to be our number one is getting the middle school Chromebooks replaced. Okay. So everything else will fall after we figure out how much that costs. Okay. All right. Anybody have any questions? You, I got one last year. But I got one. You, okay. You, you, you do. You do. You got the Dell and you've got the Chromebook. Um, I mean, you got the Dell and then you got the old one. Are they all Dell? They're all Dell. Okay. Never mind. Thank you. Um, 
And the final uh, of the plan was we're basically, we did middle school the year before, and then the next year, the last year of this plan, we're starting to replace the high school laptops for another four year cycle for the high school laptops. And those would be the Dell Latitude and we uh, use Windows 10. And then we also do uh, the PLTW laptop carts for those programs also get done at that time. And as for like CTE classes, the engineering and um, all those type of courses at the middle school, they use, they have to use laptops because AutoCAD software doesn't run on a Chromebook, so we have different machines for the PLTW courses. Um, and most likely, like someone save money. Not, I don't. We're trying to get away from content filter, physical servers. So some of these things, you know, I can cut back in order to get in this final year to get the school laptops purchased and PLTWs done first. That's great. Any other questions? No. Nope. Yep. <laughs> At the end of the five-year program, all students will have. Chrome books or Dell books. All students will know how to use these pieces of equipment and the teachers will know how to teach students that have these. Yeah, for the most part, we're in basically what I call phase two. We've already did our first five years. We're now basically, when thinking about it, year seven and doing this. So oh. the only exception for this time, this would be the first time we've ever had to put them in the hands of first and second. So it's, you know, we gotta get those kids up to speed on uh, Chromebooks. So it'll be really the first time from this year. That's what we're, that's what's gonna be coming here shortly by Thanksgiving break, is trying to get it down to first and second. So everybody else, they've they've had them from the, the you know, the years before. So I think we'll be very comfortable with them. And all of this will be at a total capital cost of? Uh, ooh, let's see, I have to go right at the beginning. I believe I have the total. Basically, I can tell you right now, we had, basically, they, they gave us 1.4 for five years. 1.2 the first year, and I think 1.4. So Ooh. that's what the county put aside Talking for our budget. $5.6 million. Yep, that sounds right. And the students um, keep keep it year to year if, when they're in the same school. Yes. You know? so they, they get it. They... So if you start in sixth grade, you're going to keep that same device from seventh to eighth, and then when you go to the next building, you get the devices for that next building. This incorporates the replacement of equipment as it ceases to be technical. Yeah, most of all, all the schedules and counties we talk to, we, we all do a four-year replacement plan for the student devices. We all agree that four years is the best. After that, they're kind of, one, Google only supports them for five years at max for the updates, so we've been doing a four-year, and that's about as long as you can go before batteries are really failing and being used for that period of time before you really do, do need to replace them. And there's no license expenses? Uh, it's a one-time licensing fee. One time. One time. We've already paid that. At which we already paid that. Thank you, sir. Happy Thanksgiving to you and your family. Thank you. Please Thank be you safe and healthy. Yes. I'm sure if there's anything else needs to be brought up. So uh, on our um, 4.01 discussion, update on return to school. It's on our paper, it's on the paper agenda. Thank you. So as you know, uh, well, I'll let Ms. Pauls tell you. Okay, so um, since we have closed school and we made that decision on um, Monday, I spoke with Dr. Ciotola throughout the weekend. We received the daily metrics. Um, I absolutely feel like we made the best decision and we actually, um, 
held off as long as we possibly could. But the rates in Queen Anne's County have really skyrocketed. And now the seven day positivity rate is 8.7, which is the highest, highest it's been this month. And the seven day case rate is 25.2%. So we're really up there. And Mrs. Moore said, if you, uh, you know, have anything to add, um, please do so. With being a small county, our numbers are really high. I know that um, in some of the neighboring counties, they've been a little bit lower, but I know that Talbot has also um, decided to go all virtual. And so we look at all of that data, that makes a difference. But one thing that I really also look at are just the raw numbers and how the positive cases have changed along with the percentage. And now, just this week, we have about five, um, five to six staff members and several students. So when you think about the health and safety of all, all of our um, Queen Anne's County Public School family, um, it's really spreading uh, like wildfire. And um, you know, no matter what we do in the schools, we use every you know every mechanism we can for cleaning. Uh, there's a lot of other things that happen in the community that bring it into the schools, and we really want to try and keep our staff and, and students safe. So um, we did shut down, and um, a letter will go out to parents. I just talked to Jeff about sending that out either Friday or Monday. And a decision will be made about bringing um, students back for small group instruction. But again, it will be based on the number of cases that we have, active cases with our staff and with our students. It will also be based on the metrics um, as well. And just as anticipated, to after the Thanksgiving holiday, it's probably going to be a little higher, but it's been really, really high um, this week. And I know Ms. Morissette had mentioned when she came in that every testing site has been full um, with folks trying to get tested. So I absolutely feel like we made the best decision. and. Um, we really want to continue to monitor it as closely as we possibly can. So <clears throat> the Friday uh, after Thanksgiving, we will send parents, that's the 27th, we'll send them an update whether or not we will resume small group instruction or if we will um, continue with all virtual. And the, the all the health metrics pretty pretty much say at 15, need to shut down and we, we went a little bit further, we went to 20. But it was, you know, it was four cases, but those four cases make a difference. So we will make that determination and working with all of our other um, stakeholders as to well, whether it will be safe for students to return to school after Thanksgiving with the small group instruction. Do you want anything, Ms. Morissette? You've been doing all the testing this week. With all the testing, we try to assess when we test the trends. So the big thing, regardless of what the governor has suggested, the traveling seems to be the big thing and people want to get tested before they travel and they want to get tested when they come back from traveling for the holiday. Um, so we, we saw a lot of families who are testing. Um, and as far as our, our list that we keep of positive cases, it's a lot of whole families that are hitting our list. So it, it's not just a member here, a member there, it's, it's whole families. And we've even seen a trend lately of several families on the same street, which is demonstrating to us that there are gatherings going on in neighborhoods and no one is adhering to the guidance. So um, we try to encourage people Keep your space, keep your mask on. You're having people in your house. They don't live in your house. Keep their mask on. Protect yourself, protect them. People want to do what they want to do. So. Is and even though. Is that what they're saying? Cause they, you all think cause it is, is the gatherings too many? The biggest gatherings? trend statewide we see when contact tracing is being done. They've traveled or someone traveled and came into their home or they attended a family gathering, with whether that's a wedding, a family reunion, a funeral, those are big ones. Um, football parties, people are relaxing their adherence to the guidelines. Homecoming parties, we had some homecoming parties um, mm -hmm. here. Yeah. Um, just social gatherings, you know, there were, that's when we're seeing it, the trends, you know, in with the staff members, if several were together. 
then it just seems to be. And it, what's really difficult, and I don't think people realize that, is that once you've had that exposure, that's 14 days that we're, we've lost a staff member. So, you know, say a student or a staff member comes into school and we do the tracing and they come in contact with another one, that's another one for another 14 days. And there's no way we can continue to staff. We're already shorthanded. There's no way we can continue to staff, you know, with the, with the growing numbers. So it makes it a little bit more difficult. So, you know, we'd love to get kids back in school, but we also love it for it to be safe for, um, for families to send their kids to school. And we want our staff members to be safe as well too. And our guidance, when we test, we make sure to tell folks until your result comes back, you should be quarantining. And we get a lot of pushback about that. They want to continue to do their normal activities until they have a result. But even if they're tested and it comes back negative, they still need to be quarantined. So we, we have staff members who've been out, you know, for like two weeks. So, okay. And let's hope everyone stays safe and, yeah. and healthy. And in the letter that I'll be sending out, I mean, we're still working and we're still making plans for when we bring back um, students. So it will mention some of the things that we've done. We met with principals today. We talked about supporting students, um, especially our seniors who are about to graduate, who are having some, um, you know, some, some issues or just not um, signing on. We are looking at the elementary and middle school um, with providing some additional supports for small groups. Um, we've added substitutes. I know that Ms. Bass has been really working diligently with that. And I know Ms. Pullen has been working with, uh, you know, OSHA. And so we are still working even though we don't have students in the classroom. And I think one of the biggest things that I'm hearing are some of the schedules for virtual. And we uh, will have a meeting with principals on Monday at all levels to revisit those virtual schedules and, and try to really um, modify them and make them work for its staff and for students because I'm hearing from, from both groups. So we are listening and we are still working, um, doing the best that we can. We did bring back EL tutors for a couple of days and um, we still have the um, paras and tutors working with our, our students virtually. So we're really trying to support them as much as we possibly can in a virtual world, which is not, you know, the model that we're accustomed to, but we're, we're really trying to make it work. So how are we handling our CTE students who can't get in for their hands-on? Are they going to make it work? Or? We try, you know, we try, but um, when we look at the schedules with, uh, with high school, we'll have to keep that in mind. But again, it only affects one high school, so it's just Queen Anne's, even though they share kids, but they, they still, it just only affects um, Ms. Hudock's students, so. When we speak about yeah. looking at the scheduling, does that include uh, looking at students that are behind and submitting their work? So one thing that we'll have for you the next time is uh, Ms. Forbes has really taken the time to <coughs> compile all of the GPAs, the data, and then she's distributed that to each of the schools and the schools have really delved into it a little bit more. So they'll be able to really isolate where they see the issue um, with students' uh, performance. And most of that is just because students are not engaged age. Um, they've reached out to students. They've called students. I was talking, I was at Queen Anne's County High School just, uh, I guess, Monday, and the um, assistant principal was on the phone with one of the students. The student was kind of out of state, kind of away from, you know, uh, the computer. I also think a lot of students are still thinking that they get a pass-fail grade, and so they're not paying that much attention to their GPAs. So, um, We've reached out to those students, and as soon as we can get students back in school, we have a plan to bring them in, and we have adult support for them to be, and we have a, a what plan. What about parent support? I know some parents are very much engaged. Others, I, I wonder just how much so. Well, some parents work, and then some of the schedules that we, we determined were not the best because of the time of the, um, the virtual instruction, the online piece. It was later in the afternoon. And so we're really going to take a look at those schedules and um, get teacher support. Actually, we had a teacher to send a schedule, a high school schedule, modified schedule that both of the principals really liked. It just didn't have the built-in transition times. So principals will work on it um, Monday, and we'll roll it out 
help to each one will roll it out to their school so that their school will have the opportunity to provide feedback and they'll come up with a schedule that works so current virtual schedule okay that's that seems to be this concern are we also going to look at a different hybrid schedule that hopefully will work with the, the virtual learning students if we can get them back into the schools yes you know our principals are so smart and they're really on it and that's one thing they really want to try and merge the two schedules so that when we go to hybrid there's not much, that much of a change and then they can continue the virtual learning so that would be great for the families to know that as soon as they could that's a plan okay we're working on it so we could talk on that about maybe december 2nd i'll be gone <laughs> no, okay. You okay. Uh, current action item: uh, the independent audit report. Ms. Towers, do we need to make a motion on that to accept the inter Okay. Okay. So, uh, do I have a motion to accept the independent audit report as presented? I move. Do I have a second? Second. Questions, comments on the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote on the motion to accept the independent audit report as audit report as presented. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed, say no. The ayes have it. The motion Motion is carried. Thank you, Ms. Towers. Appreciate it. Uh, next up, six point three five. The special education. I'm sorry. I was just helping you out. Oh, special thanks. Ed, non -public. Yep. Uh, the special education non-public tuition. Let me uh, write read all this. Do I have a motion to approve the non-public tuition from August first, twenty twenty, to gonna, They're going to present. Up. Uh, motion first, and then discussion. Come on up. Uh, to uh, July 31st, 2021, for the following institutions. Budget source is FY21, unrestricted operating budget. The pu non public institutions, Kennedy Krieger League Program, $149,819.72. The Benedictine School, $222,521.60. The Strawbridge School Board of, Ch Board of a Child, $208,200.05. Pathways School, $87,000. $898.28. St. Elizabeth School, $108,310.92. Phillips School, $95,858.36. Harbor School, $41,150. No cents. Do I have a motion? So moved. Do I second? Questions, comments, discussion. Ladies, thank you very much. How are you, Ms. Jolene? I'm doing okay. Come on in. Thank we have to do the motion first and then you get the thought. Okay. Um, for the record, I'm Jolene Smith, Supervisor of Special Education. Um, Madam President, board members, Mrs. Pauls, um, I'm here to present uh, the tuition for the non-public placements and answer any questions that you may have. So we've been around this bend. We know about... It, it might... When people are looking at our TV, you're on TV. A smile, there you go. Uh, they're saying, well, wait a minute. Uh, is this money going out? Is this money coming in? And why does it have to happen? So to answer that question, um, it's, it's not, it's actually a multifaceted answer. Um, um, so it has to happen because they provide the non-public schools provide services to some of our students that we're not able to provide services to. Um, it could be a complexity or a level of service that we do not offer here, um, and we have an obligation to provide that to them. Um, in terms of is it money coming in or money going out, um, it is a, a um, co collaboration with MSDE, so it is money that we are spending for these students but we're also receiving money um, through, it, it kind of functions like a grant um, from MSDE where they pay or reimburse school systems a portion um, of the tuition as well. So Ms. Towers, you want to chime in at this particular point and okay. explain that just a little bit further. Right, the state has a calculation as far as um, when the state funding kicks in. So uh, the first 25, 26,000, it's all 100% local obligation. And then after that, there's a percentage mix, mixture of uh, 30 to 70% state. It also depends upon uh, it, who is the placing agency. If it is a residential, then they will actually be responsible for that 
piece as well. So, so far to date, we've received 129,000 from the state to offset some of those costs. Uh, the total anticipated calculated to be around 260,000 for the year to, for state reimbursement, if nothing changes as of right now. Does anybody ever conduct an audit to see if we're actually, the students are actually getting what we're paying for? I guess the answer is yes. Yes, so um, we participate in all of the IEP meetings for each of these students. Um, I actually go to the schools and participate in the state audits as they come up. They're audited every three years. Um, so we, we are an active participant in that process so that we can look at all of their paperwork, um, making sure that they are providing the services that they're responsible responsible for providing. Okay. These are all questions that will be in people's heads if they paid any attention to this presentation. Well, they have been paying head, very so. close attention lately. <laughs> we bu we budgeted for, did we budget for the correct amount? Because um, we're in the middle of that. that correct. Um, and, and looking at the budgeted numbers, there is a shortfall significant shortfall yeah. Yeah. and Ms. Towers notice has noticed a trend in the past couple of years that the increase has been pretty drastic as well too so yeah this is huge yeah. over last year that's something that we're going to have to take a look yeah, at to address well. that I'm wondering though you know with this whole virtual thing schools closed how this is the, the top edge or are we reimbursed um, on these contracts if we don't use them how does that work so in terms of the way that COVID impacted the expenditures, um, back in the spring, there was an agreement amongst MSDE as well as the local school systems that there was a percentage that could be paid um, because of the virtual allocations or, or because of the virtual implementation, I should say. Um, different services such as one-to-one -one aids that were not being utilized, you, they were not charging systems for that. And there was a difference in the overall cost. Um, I want to say it came out to be about $88,000 at the end of the year versus compared to what we were expected to pay um, versus what we actually paid. Um, one, from July 1st, um, they, the state did mandate that all services rendered would be paid in full. Um, and unfortunately, it's not really a situation where we can bring them back and then send them because if everyone did that, there wouldn't be a school to send them back to. And then all of the, the local school systems within the state would not have the ability to provide the services that we're legally bound to provide. So, um, there was some of that, and there has been an increase, and, and a large part of that has been because of transfers. Just in the past two years, we've we've gotten four students that have transferred into Queen Anne's County that were already placed within a non-public um, placement prior to coming here. So just to give you an update on our budget, we budgeted $485,000. The total amount on this list is 913758 but that total Take doesn't away account the two, for the, the state money, right? Right. The, the, the state money is roughly about 260. That's so 260,000 for the year. But it's still 700,000. But there's also, is there any other under the 25,000 that we might have, or is just everything for the year? That's everything for the year. Okay. So that puts us at, sorry, calculator here, uh -huh. sorry. Does that include homeschooling? Is there some money, and how would that be paid if, if a child is being homeschooled? So that would be um, that would be something different. Um, if you're if you're a homeschooled student, uh, you wouldn't fall under the purview of special education under IDEA. But in order to get uh, a high school diploma or an equivalency, there would have to be some proof that they actually gathered in all the information necessary to graduate. So there has to, we don't pay for any of that, but somebody has to measure what they know to get an equivalency and graduate. They have to have an approved curriculum, and that comes through student services, and um, they come in at least twice a year for monitoring, okay. and they've been doing that virtually. Um, I'm, now, I'm used to asking questions that the, the world at large wants to know. 
so they hear it from the experts. It's a little bit different yes, for special ed than it is for home. You're an expert. So I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> so in answer to your question, we have a $168,000 deficit once state funds are budgeted funds it's uh, but I, I mean give or take 168,000 no, that's not as bad as 900 <laughs> correct <laughs> and Miss Smith and I are going to meet kind of review her restricted and unrestricted budgets and see where maybe we can do a transfer okay and this is tuition alone this does not include transportation correct transportation is on us which we haven't even gotten there, have we, Miss Pullen? We haven't even gotten to that yet. They're off the hook for a while here. The school's closed, though. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so any other questions, comments? Hearing none, I call for the uh, vote on the motion to approve the non-public tuition from August 1st, 2020 to July 31st, 2021 for the following institutions. As previously mentioned, the budgeted source is FY21 unrestricted operating budget to the amount of $913,578.93. Do I have any, do I have any, yes? Vote yes. Oh, all right. Right. Thank you. All in favor say thank you. Mm -hmm. Aye. Vote no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you. Happy holidays. Thank you. Future meetings, December 2nd and December 16th so far. We are meeting with the two new elected uh, board members on December 1st for their induction that I have confirmed with Katherine Hager. So they will be here with us on December 2nd, barring any problems. In the meantime, you two are still on the hook for <laughs> to hang out with us. Um, and then uh, we have not scheduled any time with Mabe yet. I'm waiting till the December 2nd meeting to start that schedule. Um, I, I do have a question, and uh, Mrs. Wright brought this up. Um, public comment, um, probably feel it's probably a prudent move on our part to have people um, send their public comments to the board uh, email. Can you post that, Mrs. Wright? To have them send any public comments to you, and then we'll read them at, during public comment on December 2nd. There is an um, email address that they can send it to. There is an email address they can send it to? Community comments. Community comments at? QACPS.org. At QACPS.org. All right, thank you very much. I think that would just be mm -hmm. probably the best move on our part at this time because we don't know what the numbers will be like on December 2nd. All right, um, anything else? Do we need to address anything else? Ms. Pullen, Ms. Bass, do you need to bring up anything? Love and life back there. <laughs> okay. Um, Could we just take a, a minute again to thank um, Captain Kelly and Mr. Anderson yes. for their service? Um, we have truly appreciated it. And I know I have not worked with you for that long, but it's Captain Kelly a little bit longer, Mr. Anderson. Um, you know, from the entire um, staff, we say thank you for your service and we appreciate it. So I would like to add a comment that we have made history. Captain Kelly and I, the longest serving board member <laughs> and the shortest serving board member. <laughs> I think she falls behind Faye Lister. I think Miss Faye was probably the longest serving. Oh, well, there you go. as far as I'm concerned, Captain there we go. Kelly is. How about, how about in this millennium? <laughs> I just want to say thank you all, too, and um, the way things are getting better and better, I'm just, I wish, uh, in, in some ways, I wish I was still doing this, but, and so does my husband. He's real worried about me having too much time on my hands. <laughs> but you and so be, is my son, who can't- be fully retired now. He can't stand the idea of me being home all the time with him, so I gotta go find something else to do. But thank you all, thank you. Someone asked me why I did this. And I summed it up. I, in order to do something good uh, and not be something, you, you have to think about what, uh, I think the chairman said, you stand next to the chair you sit in, which was another way of putting it. There's a lot to do here. 
and uh, trying to catch up to an already moving uh, wagon was tough to do. Well, so, we appreciate it, Mr. Mark. We appreciate you coming in. But, um, this is a good group that had a lot of talent, and I hope I added a little bit to that. We appreciate it, sir. <sighs> and Bev, Captain Kelly, thank you. It has been my honor uh, and a privilege to serve with you for the second time. Thank you. And this is something, Mr. Mark, you are very true. It's very true to say that because um, my husband asks me all the time, why do you keep staying here? And I say it's because we do something bigger than ourselves. Mm -hmm. So thank you both for being a part of this. Thank you for still being here. And to Mr. Dick Smith, who's not with us tonight, thank him very much. Thank all of you. We really truly appreciate it. Happy Thanksgiving to everyone. Uh, please be safe. And please stay healthy. Do I have a motion to go into closed session? Yes, I move that we go into closed session to discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom this pub public body has jurisdiction and any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. We also go into closed session to consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Questions or comment on the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote. The motion to go into closed session. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. We'll close out in closed session. Thank you, Mr. Strait. Happy Thanksgiving.